Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to be uh, mucking around with target drones and cruise missiles. Now, you might have seen my live stream uh, on Saturday. So this is my test rig designed to launch not one, but two aircraft from the runway. First, we throttle both engines up to 100%. Well, except for the top one, which is actually... Uh, uh, it is thrust limited to 50%, largely to make sure that the interception speed is not too fast. Now once we get up to power, what we're going to do is we're going to drop the first one and fire some little uh, sepatrons to get it up to speed. And once that gets into a flyable attitude, I ditch this and it starts running down the runway. We get a quick look at the vehicle I used for my reverse shuttle. Of course, this one is now chasing the target vehicle down the runway, and I have to switch back and forth between these to make sure that the flight attitude is more or less level here. Uh, there it is there. So now, bring the nose down just a little. So we want to have it flying in level flight as much as possible. Preferably close to the water because it's much slower there. And now, because I've been distracted, I have been flying far too fast, so I need to bleed off this excess speed. I have these uh, spoilers set up, those help a little, and uh, now uh, what I'm trying to do is let my aircraft slow down just enough so I can start doing S-turns. Now the S-turns are, they serve two purposes. First of all, turning will bleed off excess airspeed, right? Because you're, you know, you're making the drag higher. The other thing is that by turning through these S-curves, I'm flying a longer wiggling path, right? So I am going back and forth here, la rather like my dog that's running by right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm flying a longer path, so this other aircraft is flying in a straight line and should therefore catch up on me. And the, uh, the trick is you've got to kind of get yourself into a position where you can match speeds with it. Now, obviously, if you were flying a real aircraft, you could afford to do a long, sweeping turn to get yourself onto the 6 o'clock position. However, this is Kerbal Space Program, and if you go more than a few kilometers away, it will cause your aircraft, to, the other target, to just disappear. Also, if you quick save while in flight, the other object will disappear as well. It's rather frustrating because you have to go through this setup time every time you want to do this. Now, this target uh, comes from the BD Armory mod by a Bahamut D. Uh, it is not just this single gun, there's a whole bunch of weapons, guns, missiles and everything for you to destroy things with. I just want to use this simple 20mm cannon to try shooting this target out of the sky. Now there is a small amount of uh, play in the, the sight. It will try to gimbal onto the target just a little, so let's try lining it up and getting super close. This is hard. And... Oh, excellent! First shot! What about that? What did we knock off? And... Oh, we knocked off its engine! It is now a doomed drone. Doomed to bleed off its airspeed until it falls into the ocean, meeting its end. I'm just trying to slow down once again so I can actually get a good look at this thing. Let's turn around... Again, trying to stay within a couple of kilometers means I can't do big sweeping turns because there's a pretty good chance that it will not uh, survive its encounter with the physics load distance. Now I am the one with no power, but I... I suspect that I will be able to recover from this no power situation, whereas you, little drony Ron, I suspect you have r exhausted your box of tricks, and there's only one place for you to go. Okay, now we're getting around, uh, and of course at that point, that's once again lucky to say my dog deciding to run around and create jingle jangle sounds in the background. There it is. No. Oh. How are we doing? 600 meters up? Ah, oh, look at it, it's just nose diving in, it's uh, aerolo aero ailerons, which I can never say per correctly, pitched all the way up, and no, it is doomed. And so, let us go on and take a look at some other stuff. Now, if I forget to throttle the engine down to 50%, as I did earlier, what happens, of course, is that the intercept speed is around Mach 1. And that's all well and good, because the aircraft will fly at that speed. However, this being at Ferrum Aerospace, you have to be extra careful, because sometimes you lose your wings. That is uh, why I have to throttle that thing back. It has a big engine for a little airframe, and... <laughs>
Yeah, that thing was flying a lot faster than even your, your Tomahawk cruise missiles would. Now, uh, interestingly enough, you can also knock these things out of the sky instead of using the guns, which is a challenge in and of itself, which uh, actually goes back to the V-1 missile from World War II. It was actually surprisingly common for pilots to knock V-1 missiles out of their uh, out of their intended route using their wingtips. Now they didn't collide directly with it, but uh, <laughs> they uh, what they did was they put their wing right under the the wing on the V-1, and it would adjust the airflow, and the thing would start to roll, and eventually lose control and crash. Now obviously you can't do that in Kerbal Space Program because the even Ferrum Aerospace doesn't emulate the airflow between surfaces on two different objects. At least I don't think it does yet. Maybe Ferrum will prove me wrong here. So that means straight up colliding is the only option open to us and that does not always end well. Yes, <laughs> well it didn't end well for the missile but this aircraft was actually surprisingly flyable after the fact, it just wanted to roll all the time. I was in fact able to land this with this uh, set of damage. Now the reason why pilots would perform such a dangerous maneuver was because, well the V-1 was essentially a flying bomb, it had a very large warhead in it. And when they engaged the weapon at typical air-to-air -air combat ranges with their cannons, uh, what would happen was the explosion would be very powerful, it would throw off a lot of debris and they had a good chance of destroying their aircraft. So I emulated this by creating a debris cloud, and as you see, yes, debris from a disintegrating target can have a serious negative effect on your vehicle's airworthiness. I tried to fly this one, you see me trying to begin a turn back towards base and I throttle back and I think at that point as I throttle back I really start to lose things because my speed drops off and at some point it just becomes too much. I should, I think I had a better chance of flying it if I'd kept the engine throttled up. But look, there, it starts to just, wait, no, that was it, there, there, oh yeah, it just starts to spin out of control. As, as I try, I lose it, and I do my best to recover it, but there's really just not enough wing on the right-hand side for me to get any control. So it's in flying in straight flight again, but it does not want, I can't get it to nose up, and eventually we stall and crash. Boom. So anyway. I thought it would be fun to actually try building something that looked more like a real V-1 missile. Now the V-1 was a weapon from World War II, less famous than the V-2 perhaps, but actually vastly more effective. It launched off a rail using little solid rocket motors, and then it had a single pulse jet that was propelling it, and that's kind of mounted up on the back there. Now the pulse jet on the V-1 generated about 900 pounds of thrust, so that's le about 4 kilonewtons of thrust I believe. And it had an onboard mechanical guidance system that would fly at about 250 kilometers, 160 miles to its target where it would then nose down and crash into the ground and deliver a, an 800 kilo warhead. Now the, the guidance system was built around a gyro compass that would more or less keep it flying in a straight line. They would point it in the direction they wanted it to go and then on the front they had a little propeller that would spin and as it span it would internally, the counter would decrease. After it had reached a certain threshold it would arm the warhead and then after it hit its final uh, threshold it would trigger all its control surfaces to point its nose at the ground and it was intended to power dive into the target. However, due to a design flaw in the early engine propulsion system, the, as soon as it went into the dive, the negative Gs would cut off flow to the engine and it would uh, go all quiet. And that was, that was kind of a, you know, a well-known phenomena at the time, that as soon as the buzz bomb stopped making its characteristic 50 hertz buzz, it was going to hit its target. And many of these hit their targets within about 8 miles. So anyway, trying to get this in the air at the same time as a, uh, an aircraft, required a little uh, redesign of my rig. I decided to go with straight wings in this aircraft to make it a little more like the Spitfires and uh, Hurricanes and, uh, and Typhoons and everything off the air. Oh, the Tempest, the Hawker Tempest was one which was extra fast and it was deployed to deal with the buzz bombs. Um, however, I did have to replace the regular jet engine with a 
uh, <laughs> with a rapier. The reason being, the rapier is the only jet engine that has uh, two attachment points, one at the front and one at the rear. So getting this into the air at the same time did require a bit of work, and you see I kind of messed this up. I accidentally hit the gear button here, tore that off. <laughs> I'm, I'm skidding along, you see there, I, I dropped the landing gear. Getting two things into the air is difficult, and there's another range, beyond physics range. If you go beyond a certain distance, you'll frequently find out that the engines on the other things simply stop working if they're sitting on the ground. There's like some distance interior to the physics range where that happens. So, trying again, getting that set up, and this is, has got its cart ready to go there, throttle the engine, fire those rockets, and no, I can't steer it! There goes its engine once again. Uh, I, I went through this quite a bit trying to make this happen, but at least this one got into the air this time. Using only only about 10 kilonewtons of thrust, this is engine it has been scaled down using tweak scale to make it look a little more of the part. To replicate the characteristic look of the Argos uh, pulse jet. Now the pulse jet actually is an interesting th engine worth talking about. Now the pulse jet on the V1 is actually kind of worth talking about because not many... Pulse jet is a rare thing these days. Pulse jet is not a rocket, as uh, many people think. Pulse jet has an air intake and it has you know, fuel and they combust in there and they generate thrust. It's not a ramjet though. Now in the V1, what you had at the front was a series of louvers that would open and close. They would open to let in air and then when there was enough fuel in there, it would com it, it would ignite, explode and the pressure would close these louvers and the thrust would go out the back. So, so this meant it wasn't continuously burning. What it was doing is you have an explosion and you would have another explosion, one after the other, 50 times a second, which accounted for the characteristic buzz of the V2 buzz bombs. The engine typically fired about 50 times per second. And let's try getting this thing on target here. Coming in and... Oh, it's much better to do this in first person view. There, shot it! I think I... Oh yes, that looked good. Let's see how much has been destroyed. Oh look, taken off the air intake and the engine. And so it becomes the first victim, the first of a new class of victims. However, as it happens, this aircraft was not well designed and it, um, well, I ended up crashing it into the ground quite a lot. <laughs> but I did shoot down this. There it goes, a first victory. During the V1 bombing campaign from June 1944 to September 1944, they launched about 30,000 of these. About 8,000 only, only about 8,000 got to their target because the Allied forces very quickly put together defences that made sense. They put, you know, barrage balloons. They put the fastest planes they could find, uh, essentially, along the line of flight of these. Oh, and there's a good one, falling apart. It's much more satisfying when bits fall off and the target disintegrates. Here's another one, flying in third-person view again. Ah, excellent. And bits flying everywhere, none of them hitting my aircraft, but of course, that's because we're flying in the real world and we don't break and generate shrapnel. Also note that I was flying the, the plane with the gear down because I was hoping that that would act as a little bit of an air brake to help slow me down. Turns out that matching speeds with these things is incredibly hard and I could only manage plus or minus about 10 meters per second for any length of time. But there, one more into the ground. Now, you know, for pulse jet engines, incidentally, there's another design of pulse jet, which is the U-shaped pulse jet, and that's even more interesting because it has zero moving parts. It has one intake loop and it has an outlet loop, and just because of the imbalance in the sizes of those, one will preferably suck in air and the other will preferably send out exhaust. And once you get those things going, they, uh, they will pretty much run on their own as long as you supply them fuel. There's no... Uh, no moving parts at all. There's a guy on YouTube I like to see, uh, Colin Furs. He's he's just you know manic bundle of energy building pulse jets and and other things. Well worth watching. Uh, I don't recommend building one yourself and unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, but uh, all the same, uh, there are fun things to look at. 
Now, incidentally, after World War II, the V1 design was actually copied by France, Russia, and uh, the US. The US built their own versions. The uh, Russians captured them, and then they used them to attack certain uh, places on the Eastern Front. And France later used the design for target drones, like I'm doing. Here's my attempt to knock this one out of the sky using good old-fashioned collision technique. Again, in real life, what they had to do was get up very close next to them and then place one wingtip under their wing, the wingtip of the target. And of course, this is very hard because it would be flying at 350 miles an hour, which was very close to the upper speed of some of these aircraft. And just very carefully put my nose onto this target because my wing certainly isn't going to do it. And... Oh, there we go! Mating confirmed! Uh-oh, uh-oh. This is where I think I'm hooked onto it. Uh-oh. No! <laughs> we are locked in an em a deadly embrace in the sky. Okay, and now I'm stalling out of control. That is not a good sign. We are both stricken, but... Uh, with the brains of the pilot on board, I can regain control, and victory is mine. So yes, so that's target interception, a little bit of history of the V1 bomb. And uh, yeah, you know, I've seen people do this, and they've managed to successfully perform air-to-air -air refueling. And uh, I should try that at some point. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.